Daniel. Daniel was a young Jewish lad taken captive from Israel into the land of Babylon. He lived in a section of the country where many of his people lived and he spoke their language. With them, he observed all the Jewish laws and rites. He was a handsome child, his parents and teachers were proud of him. One day a man named Asphanes came to the village where Daniel lived. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, has sent me, he explained to the people gathered around him. He has sent me to search for the most perfect children in the land. Choose from the sons of kings and princes or of the Israelite captives, the king said. They must have wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and they must have grace. These children, Asphinx told the people, were to live in the palace and learn the language of Babylon, and for three years they were to be taught by the greatest teachers in the land. During that time, they were to have the same good meat and fine wine as were served at the king's table. Then Asphanes talked to the children of the village. Daniel delighted him at once with his hands, some looks and charm, and his ready answers. You must come with me to the palace, he said. The king will be well pleased with you. Daniel ran happily to his parents to take his leave. It is wonderful, they said. You will be brought up in the household of the palace and learn all of the things a royal child learns. Daniel went with Asphinx to the palace and met the king's servant Malasar, who was to care for Daniel. Asphanes gave Daniel a new name, Baltasar. Malasar had three other Jewish captives in his charge who had been renamed Sidrach, Misach, and Abdenego. Daniel and these three other lads became close friends. When the meals were brought, Daniel did not cut the rich foods of the king, nor did he drink the wine. He decided in his heart that he wanted the simpler food in keeping with the laws of his people. When his companions saw this, they, too, refused the food. When Asphanes noticed that Daniel and his friends had grown thin and listless, he was worried. I fear the king, who ordered his own food and wine for these children, he told Malasar. My life may be in danger, and he went away sadly. Daniel heard, and he spoke to Malasar, please, he begged, give us just ten days before you judge us. In those ten days, give us fresh simple food and plain water. At the end of that time, judge us. Compare our faces with those of the children who eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine. Malasar agreed, and he did as Daniel asked. At the end of ten days, their faces were fatter and more fair than those of the other children. Malasar took them to Asphanes. When Asphanes saw that the children were healthier and happier and more alert than the other children, he did not ask them again to eat their portion of the king's meat nor drink the king's wine. The boys enjoyed their studies and grew uncommonly wise. Daniel also learned to understand dreams and could explain their meaning. When three years had passed, Daniel and his friends were brought before the king with all the other children. None of them could compare with these four. In all the questions King Nebuchadnezzar asked them, their answer showed ten times the wisdom of those of the most learned men and astrologers of the land, and the king was well pleased. When he learned that Daniel could also interpret dreams, he was greatly impressed and granted many favors to Daniel and his three friends. Esther In Persia, there was a beautiful young Jewish maiden named Esther. She kept house for her uncle, Mordecai, who was keeper of the palace gates. He had adopted her when her parents died. 
Each evening as Esther served her uncle his dinner he told her the news of the day from the palace. One night he came home in great excitement. Sit down, he said to Esther. Tonight I have very important news. You will remember that I told you some time ago that King Xerxes banished his wife, Queen Vashti, for disobedience. Now he has sent out soldiers into all the provinces seeking the fairest maiden in the land to be his queen in Vashti's place. Esther's heart beat faster and faster as she listened. Do you mean, she began. Yes, her uncle answered. We will take you to the palace and present you to the king. Who knows, he may choose you from above all the maidens in the land. That is beyond my dreams, she said. Just to see the king is happiness enough. A few nights later, when Mordecai came home he said, Tomorrow I will take you to the palace. Already many maidens are gathered there. In the morning, on the way to the king, Mordecai warned Esther, Tell no one you are Jewish, he said. Be modest and good. I will keep watch to see that all is well with you, and he left her at the gate. Esther stayed at the palace, in the women's house, with many other maidens. In the afternoons they sat in the courtyard and each day Mordecai walked by to see Esther. At last the day came when it was Esther's turn to go before the king. She dressed carefully and followed the servant to the royal chambers. Esther trembled when she stood before the king and she lowered her eyes. Come closer, he said. She came closer and stood before him and looked up at the king. It seemed to Esther a long time that he looked at her, and then he smiled. Kneel down before me on the step, he said, and as Esther knelt before the king he placed the royal crown upon her head, for he loved her more than any of the maidens who had been brought before him. Esther could hardly believe what had happened. That she, Esther, a little Jewish maiden, was now queen of Persia. One day as Queen Esther sat embroidering in her court, her uncle came to see her. My child, he said, you must warn your husband, the king, that his life is in danger. Two of the chamberlains who keep the doors are angry with the king and they plan to kill him. When the king sent for Esther she told him what her uncle had told her. Mordecai, your gatekeeper, has told me, she said. When the king found that the story was true he had the chamberlains hanged from a tree and he had the story written in the history of the country. Again Mordecai came to Esther greatly agitated. What is it? Esther asked. Amon, one of the most important princes, has been given the king's ring and he has been placed in power next to the king, her uncle told Esther, and everyone bows down to him. Some of the other keepers of the doors and gates have noticed that I do not bow. I have told them I am a Jew and it is against our laws. Amon is angry but he is not angry at me alone, nor does he want to kill me alone. He has gotten permission from the king to kill all the Jewish people in the land. Our people know of the decree, and that the king has set his seal upon it, and they are fasting and praying. It is your duty to go to the king and to try to save our people. He showed Esther one of the letters that were sent out to all the king's provinces with orders to destroy all Jews, young and old, little children and women, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month. 
But how can I see the king? Esther asked. He has not sent for me for thirty days. You must find a way, her uncle said. You know well, Esther said, and all the king's servants and all the king's people know that no one, man or woman, may enter the inner court of the king unless he is called. There is a law that anyone who enters without invitation may be put to death unless the king waves his golden scepter. Her uncle said, if all the Jews in the land are destroyed, they will be avenged by other Jews from other lands. Even you would not escape, for they would come for you, even into the king's palace. Esther was frightened. Go, she said, and send out word to all our people to fast and to pray for me for three days. I will do the same. At the end of that time I will go to the king. On the third day Esther put on her royal robes and she went and stood in the inner court of the king's house. The king sat on his throne in the royal house. When he saw Esther he held out to her the golden scepter and she came forward and touched the tip of it. What will you have, Esther? he asked. Whatever you desire, he said, up to half of what I have shall be yours. If it would please the king, she said, I should like to prepare a banquet tonight for you and Amman. The king said they would come and he sent word to Amman to do as Esther asked. The king and Amman came to the banquet and they drank of the wine she had set out. What is it you would like to ask of me? The king asked Esther. You shall have your wish even though it be for half the kingdom. If I have pleased you, Esther replied, let the king and Amman come to the banquet I shall prepare tomorrow night, and then I will answer the king. When Amman and the king came to the second banquet Esther had prepared, the king asked her again, What is it you desire? It shall be given you even if it is half my kingdom. If I have found favor with you, Esther said, let my life be spared and the lives of my people, for I am of the Jewish people. A decree has gone out that we are to be destroyed. Mardukai, your gatekeeper, is my uncle and he has told me these things. Who is it who dares to do this? the king asked. Our enemy, Esther answered, is the wicked Amman. Mardukai angered him because he would not bow to him. The king was angry. He rose and left his wine and went out into the palace garden. When he returned, one of his chamberlains whispered to him, Amman has built a gallows in the courtyard of his house. Here he plans to hang Mardukai. The king became more angry than ever. Hang Amman there, he shouted. When this had been done the king gave to Esther the house of Amman, and he summoned Mardukai. The king gave Mardukai the ring that he had taken back from Amman, and set Mardukai in charge of the house of Amman. Once more Esther knelt at the feet of the king and she begged him with tears to outlaw Amon's decree and to save the lives of her people. The king held out his golden scepter and once again Esther touched its tip. Write an order, the king said, to save the Jews and seal it with the king's ring and send it throughout the land. Riders on horses, mules, and camels took the letters and they went into all the cities and all the provinces of the land. There was gladness and joy in the homes of the Jews when they learned that Queen Esther had spared their lives by appealing to the king. Esther was happy now. Her people were free and her husband knew the truth, that she was Jewish, 
her uncle who had cared for her and raised her was now next in power to the king. The king still loved her and found her beautiful, for he had granted her wish.